to to trickle in Dr. Lascana. So I will just, I will, yes. oh, no worries, Rebecca. We know the anatomy struggle, <laughs> been there. So I will just start with uh, a brief introduction. And when I say brief, I mean, we could talk about Dr. Lascano for so long. So Dr. Lascano has a PhD in global epidemiology and disease control, as well as a master's in biostatistics and health policy from Johns Hopkins. He is an associate professor at the Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia and has adjunct appointments at the Tulane John Hopkins Wake Forest and Texas Medical Branch Universities. He leads the Emerging Infectious and Climate Change Unit and Master's and Doctoral Programs in Epidemiological Research at UPCH. Between 2002 and 2015, he directed the Public Health Training Program and Parasitology Department at the U.S. Naval Medical Research Unit, number six in Peru, and between 2017 and 2018, was a director general of Peru's National Center for Epidemiology, Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC Peru. So with that being said, Dr. Lascano, thank you for being here and um, we are so excited. Thank you for the in introduction. Um, very, very exciting to talking to you. Um, I, I'm logging in with my phone so I, I can get better audio. And I hope that um, the presentation I can do from my computer, despite the quality of the, of the signal, uh, of the uh, bandwidth. Um, my plan, and, and please uh, advise if we should do different, um, was to provide an updated version of the presentation from the last time. Um, and, and try to uh, discuss some, some other topics like potentially the role of uh, medical and public health students in, uh, in, in global health pandemic response and other related issues. Does that sound okay? I understand we have until three, uh, well, at my time three, I would have an hour, right, total, including questions and discussion. Yeah? Okay, great. And um, just for, for verify the background you, you guys are medical students is that correct um what years yeah first and second years first and second year okay fantastic and you have you have an, an interest uh, in in global health um, and of course you're um, affiliated with a fantastic uh, a medical school and, and university ucla where my dear wife works um and i um, very excited to, to, to talk to you all. Um, I'm gonna start with the, um, with the presentation. Let me see if I have it already. No, I don't have it yet. Um, give me one second to have the presentation and, and ready for you guys. There you go, here. And now we will screen share. Screen share and this one, yeah. There we go. Um, so I'm I'm gonna talk to you um briefly uh, about my experience um supporting the COVID nineteen response of Peru, um in different um, stages, and from the beginning of the pandemic until now, and what has uh, what have I learned um during the process, um. This is uh, just my opinions, by the way. This is in no fa no way or fashion um, uh, a formal position of uh, my university or the um, Ministry of Health where I worked on Bolivian government in any way. Um, this is just some crazy thoughts um, after being at some very interesting places and in very interesting times, very really challenging times. Uh, just for background, we um, in Peru um, officially the pandemic set foot on uh, March the first. Um, we um, in that moment the Peruvian government confirmed the first case, 
and uh, the first death was confirmed on March 16th. And of course, like most places, this shown that uh, probably the, the uh, COVID-19 was circulating for a while, uh, a few weeks or maybe a few months uh, before that. Um, in that moment, uh, the Peruvian government was really proactive and, 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 and quick to respond in a very intense way, in a very um, a, a, a drastic way to many uh, closing schools, closing borders. Um, first, the school closed were closed on, uh, on, on that week. And then on the, on the week after the first case, when, uh, upon confirmation of others, and then the first Monday, I think it was the 16th of March, um, uh, all the skies were closed internally and externally. There were curfews and travel bans and full lockdown that is one of the longest in the world and uh, lasted uh, almost four months and for, for parts of the country and lasted maybe more for some others that had to stay longer because of where they were in the epidemic. Um, and uh, a very strict uh, curfew at night at the beginning on full lockdowns on Sundays, no walks for people for two months. We were really, you know, inside our homes. I, uh, I was really lucky that, you know, 12 days after the, the lockdown, they called me to work with the Ministry of Health. So I was able to actually step outside the house. But, um, but that, until that time, nobody from, from home had been able to go out except for just buying groceries and really essential purchases. And um, there were numerous times there were full additional lockdowns uh, established. And, it, it, you know, as, as always, and, and th these decisions were challenged, were questioned whether it was. At the moment, people said, well, there's really no, no reason to go that strict, to be that strict. Um, there's really, this is not really a threat. There were some physicians airing comments that uh, this was not really even a pandemic. So we had our own, ver our own, our own version of uh, uh, negacionistas, negationists, I don't know how to say, denialists. Um, and later, when time came out, start, people started saying, no, we need, to, we need to go much earlier into lockdown. So there were all sorts of opinions. Everybody had their own. Um, and um, it, this was, uh, for in, within the public health community, this was initially seen as a proactive response, as, as, as a you know, responsible response uh, at, at the moment, maybe a little too extreme, given that we didn't know many things, but uh, later on, this shown to be probably too long and too, too hard for the country. And, and in part, the reason for that um, a aggressive response was that there was a very clear awareness in, in different areas of government of how 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 many challenges are the country face? The country, you know, was going through to face the pandemic. We we knew that we had a broken system, health system divided in multiple providers um, with uh, large fractions of the population without insurance, whose only hope was to attend overcrowded Ministry of Health facilities that didn't really have ICU capacity. You know that basically we never had a lift a extra ICU beds available, and in that moment we needed to make room. And a lot of people were there in ICU for support. They were prioritized, and some people were sent home to continue care, or they were put on special wings. And all sorts of uh, challenges of that level. Um, when the when the lockdown started and we started to try to, the government tried to start to provide uh, support for the people who were in lockdown and not getting income, we realized how challenging it was to pay people, to provide um, uh, financial support to people who did not exist in the formal financial system of the country. Didn't have a bank account, many not even have an ID in certain places. 
there were no banks, uh, uh, bank offices in many areas, or they were really far. And normally people would take buses and travel to take, to go to the bank. And so it was, it became really challenging to deliver the money that was uh, available for them. And over time, lockdown and pandemic fatigue um, could begin to increase and uh, began, uh, people started to get higher and um, not, uh, not contribute to it, not, not commit to it. And uh, mobility started increasing, uh, markets were pointed, public markets were pointed as high risk places, despite the fact that many of them were open places or open environments. Uh, we, we, we really didn't have the best data at the time to make those statements, but uh, uh, cross-sectional uh, samples in markets show that people who were in market, that were in markets with, you know, were positive to, they had antibodies. And although that didn't really prove that people were getting infected in markets, uh, there was a lot of um, uh, concern about it because of the number of people, the crowds, and there were a lot of uh, actions that didn't, sadly didn't have a lot of uh, evidence support. And uh, Peru was in a pre-electoral year in 2020. Uh, we, uh, the, the, there had been already the previous um, the previous president had, or the, the president at the moment had already closed Crown Congress and called for elections for a new Congress. So there was a lot of opposition. He was actually the second president within the legal term. The first one had been had, had to quit in the middle of a corruption scandal. So it, it was a very complex environment politically for the pandemic, which probably contributed to the, 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 the consequences and the impact. One of the things that the Ministry of Health did at the moment was um, to appoint uh, some advisory boards uh, within the first, uh, some of them as early as the first two weeks within the, the time that the pandemic um, uh, started in Peru. And there was one, the first one was clinical experts and the second one was an epidemiology advisory board and I was uh, invited to form part of that committee. And many others came and uh, most of them didn't really continue active for much longer. And some of them like ours uh, remain active for quite a long time and, and working really close with government. Um, these, these boards included in a, a really never seen um, act of uh, uh, political unselfishness, uh, many former ministers were invited. This is not really typical in a country like Peru when you spend some time in office, then you're banned from coming back basically because the, the opposition parties who takes over after you don't want you near by any means. So in this case, um, many ministers were not only invited but also accepted. Some of them, some didn't accept. Uh, and, and in part because of political hopes, but um, most of them accepted and many and, and, and many people worked for a while and some even continue working there uh, at the moment. And this brought uh, a community of scientists to a government who were um, not, uh, had not been as, as present as before. I was a little bit of a rare bird um, uh, in, in ministry before, because I'm a scientist who went to work in, as a director for epidemiology. And there's a few scientists like me who have crossed the lines, but it is relatively rare. And it was because my interest in health policy and my interest in, uh, in, in public, my work in public health before my closeness to outbreak investigation and response. But in general, the presence of these scientists brought uh, generated connection to new audiences, brought different issues, but it also generated some clashes um, because we you know, started to receive uh, greater levels of attention. There were a lot of expectations from some people. Languages were very different. It's, you know, many of us were you know, not, not trained or used to talk to media and to talk to um, uh, um, uh, journalists and 
and follow the journalist author, uh, 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 journalist goals of you know feeding headlines and selling newspapers or uh, hours. So in some cases there were many participations of these scientists and these uh, groups that were actually taken out of context and placed in a in, and, and, and stated in a different way, you know, uh, and it, it, it became, you know, in, in several areas that we contributed uh, as a community, we contributed to the chaos and, and some areas, while in some others we were trying to help and we actually, I think many, many, many people did help. But I, I think it, the one of the biggest challenges was trying to communicate the uncertainty of the pandemic in a, in a clear and simple way was very difficult um, to in, in, a, in, a, in a politically complex environment, but also with uh, people um, feeling um, really um, uh, um, vulnerable and, 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 and needing reassurance. Um, so these these different groups they all remain have some independence and you know in and, and that way they can express people can express their opinions but at the same time it was not really you know necessarily a well a handle or work a choreographed uh, exercise of let's just have one voice one message or you know a, a few voices but a single message that is uh, typical in, in in public health and, and both public communication so in that way, we try to uh, navigate the uncertainty of the pandemic and establish some bridges with, in, in the, with, with the science and, and the policy. And um, in, uh, this has proven uh, valuable in, 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 uh, across the world when particularly in low middle income countries where ministries don't necessarily have all the technical and resources and capacity. So, information technology was brought in in some ways. Um, there was more cross-disciplinary intersectorial work. Some of these committees of experts were really diverse. In our case, our, our, our committee our, our, was called Prospective and it was created by a lawyer who had worked in um, labor projections and in labor projections, he, they had a team of lawyers who work on labor and were analyzing the labor market um, to understand where it would go and how to adapt to it, how to respond. And he brought the idea and we were coordinated by a lawyer who was a complete outsider. But it was really interesting working with him because he knew the inner ways of government very well in a way that many of us didn't. And in, in the group, there were um, people working in health and, and political science and modeling epi clean some clinicians um some people with backgrounds in economics so it, it was very interesting work across lines and, and and trying to mix expertise to bring it in definitely uh, the data science had received a gigantic push during the during the pandemic and that, that was part of it and also, in some of us were breaches to external uh, expertise and, uh, and, and and sources of information. Okay. Although I gotta say that ministries are, are in that way uh, um, well informed these days. They're well connected, at least in countries like Peru. And in theory, we're bringing unbiased perspectives, and then probably we became a little bit of the part of the furniture. Uh, in, in a way that we became very used to the inner thinking and directions of government. And some committees were a little bit more external to the ministry, but we, our, our committee at least we recited, uh, we worked right next to the minister. So I think we probably got contaminated in a way in, a, in, our, in our perspectives, uh, which probably is a good thing at the, at the same time. Um, so uh, we used, um, uh, some some level of data and and this is the interesting part that uh, right now we're even using more data than before even when our you know official links with um, government and committee and committees have ended but initially we got first access to some of the sources of data that the ministry only had it, that it did take us a, quite a long time to get access to the data even when we were officially appointed and visible members of uh, the government response, but there were all sorts of sensitivities that we had to go through and, and 
work, work out. Um, we eventually identify good sources who tell us uh, at, at a reasonable level of detail and without significant delays, uh, what were the trends of the pandemic. And we got to know firsthand all the biases and limitation of all the different other sources. And we picked uh, mortality data as at the moment, and we're talking about April 2020, the, the most reliable data source, particularly the death certificate signed by physicians across the country, the most reliable and timely source for monitoring the pandemic, even th despite the fact that uh, death happens usually in our case, three weeks on average after infection. But it, it worked out like a clock. It was there every other day. The data was almost complete, 98, 99% complete across the country. We measured that um, sustainably since April until now. And it was really robust. It didn't matter who, how much testing was being done, you know, what, what test or whatnot, because we used the clinically diagnosed uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, cause of deaths. Uh, and I said in plural, because there were many words used for that. But it, it, it was really robust data and it allowed us to track down until now um, the, 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 the pandemic. And we had this data, and then we, we also advocated for this data being public. So it became public, the, ministers, the Ministry of Health in, um, in May 2020 made it open. And oh my God, when people realized that there were that many deaths and government had been saying it for a long time, but oh my God, all the media, all the news, all the Twitter experts, all the you know Instagram experts, oh my God, the government had been saying all along, we, we probably have a lot more non-confirmed deaths because we're only confirming a fraction. But it, you know, it, it, this, this is the, one of the many areas where things are blown out, out of proportion and not by random, but you know, with personal interests of many. Eventually more data started to be uh, uh, recorded systematically in a good way, occupation of COVID uh, resources in hospitals, inpatient, uh, regular beds, hospitalization beds, and ICU beds. Um, the, the number of cases was so biased from the beginning. Many people use them and get got to really wrong conclusions. And uh, it was really difficult to convince people that that data was three weeks delayed. And it was really not telling you the trend because if it's going down, it's not because the, the pandemic is going down, but it's because the data is not there yet. And eventually when there were more, um, a, a molecular tests done better capacity for diagnose, diagnosis in the country and antigen and rapid antigen tests, we started to look at the positivity of uh, the test positivity proportion. And um, with the many, many biases and uneven spatial distribution of, of this data. But um, this other data was added over time to our analysis and to our assessment of trends. And please stop me any points of, you know, to talk about this if you have questions. And this all makes sense to me because I've been looking at it for quite a long time, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's relatively new from more perspectives. Um, and, you know, and, and just to show you some of the really basic things that we do, because we, we do nothing fancy. We're not IHME. We're not, uh, you know, the, the, the Imperial College London modeling unit. We basically, the, I, I'm one of the first ministers used to tease us. We, we put points in curves. Basically, that's, that's what they teased us about. We, you know, added an extra point every day to the curve and look at what was the trend, the, the shorter trend, because soon we realized that it was really hard to get an idea of what was gonna happen in a month or three months or six months. And variants really demonstrate us that, uh, you know, around November when things um, um, it, it started to behave in a very different way. But um, over that time, we'll learn how to, you know, project in the short term and in the long term. We learn from our mistakes in trying to make long term projections that were over a month, and uh, we started to to realize, for example, really early on that, you know, like we started to realize in October that something was cooking. And then we got confirmation in November that whatever was cooking was growing 
and then the, slide, the, 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 the storm of the second wave hit us hard and really hard. It became bigger than the first wave. It, uh, it crashed the capacities of the health system because they were already still overloaded because cases, as you can see here, never went down to zero. These are deaths, never went down to zero. There remain a substantial amount of transmission everywhere in the country. The, the ICU beds were never freeze. So the second wave came and flood us um, for a long time. Now we are considerably longer after first wave. We've been 22 weeks uh, going down as of last, uh, well, 24 weeks uh, going down. There was a brief moment here when cases go, uh, deaths went up and then came down again. But it's been a continuous decrease, much longer than the case of the first wave. And this is starting to look like something very different in the sense that they may, a country with so much infection like Peru may not have a third, a major third wave, but that's just our hope maybe. We have to be cautious about saying something like that uh, in public because politicians may take it in a different way. And where now we're seeing just decreases in mortality, although Lima have grown to two weeks proportionally in important fashion, but still in very low levels of deaths. The ICU beds uh, this week are coming down despite the fact that um, hospitalization beds were going up until last week for three weeks in a row. And uh, uh, the positivity of rapid tests or rapid antigenic tests has gone up. Uh, apparently it's gonna be going up for two weeks now. And uh, cases have, have been alternating with these ups and downs and our, our variants have drastically changed uh, from a, 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 a domination of lambda during the second wave to er, er, late in this very late in the third wave, in the second wave uh, uh, replacement by the delta variant although despite of months with domination of delta we haven't really had a major um, uh, a major wave yet and th there's a question here um, in an ideal world is there any additional data that you would like to have that isn't currently available to inform decisions yeah um, Something that we really wanted, and we had it, but not in real time with a lot of difficulty, was mobility data. But not the Google mobility data or the Facebook mobility data that is only limited to people who have um, a, a data plans for Facebook or Google, where they include Facebook or Google. But um, what we wanted is on real time, individual data on people's movement from their cell phones and from cell phone towers. Because we knew that that uh, could tell us where people congregate, but it was never available on real time. It was available delayed and aggregate. And um, that I think that would have been very useful. We got some level of access to that data and then it was blocked for a few weeks and for a few months. Um, and um, we, we then got it access, but it was always choppy. And telcos uh, use a lot of that data, um, but they didn't have, I mean, they, they, they gave it to government, but they were not terribly happy to share it. Um, and uh, the idea of having it uh, at the individual level at a really fine levels is to know where people come from and what numbers, where do they stop and when they do return so you can manage uh, conglomerations of people and reduce risk, particularly with those conglomerations occur on um, closed spaces. What we would love to have now available is the mix of immunization status and infection and reinfection uh, status in every single database that the government is making public now, because uh, that those dynamics are very different. People who get vaccinated uh, and or don't um, act in very different ways often. And um, it is important to understand their behavior separately. And uh, same with people who got infected earlier um, or who well, have gotten infected and, and you know, believe that they may have some level of protection uh, from, from, a, from infection. Just to continue showing you some examples of the data we analyzed, these are our weekly curves on uh, hospitalization, uh, on, on, on bed usage. Um, these are uh, ICU beds, the, 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 X, the axis is on the right-hand side. We're currently in, a, in about 40 something percent and in, in, in going down. There's some variability during the week, but it's not only 
going down because there's less people using them, but also there's a uh, demanding uh, as you bet. Uh, that has had the reduction of occupation has even occurred despite the fact that the government has shut down some uh, ICU beds in different places, the hospitals, because um, there's no more need and, uh, and ICU doctors really need a rest and all the ICU staff that has been working over time for 18 months. Uh, regular beds, um, the usage has also been dropping, although it had an increase here and it may come back again to, to jump because to, to go keep going high, keep going up um, because it seems to be an artifact here for five days. We'll see how that changes next week. But again, also I see a hospitalization bed, the total has of operational beds have been dropping along for quite a long time. So their hospitals are closing their ICU, their, um, the COVID areas uh, because of the lower demand. And these, the heterogeneity within the country, you can see here that have three regions that have really high levels of usage of beds, two that are around the average and then uh, light variation of low rates of occupation. But there's, you have these five regions where basically determining the average of the country and there are in really high levels. And those are very vulnerable regions because if you know there's a major third wave, these are the regions that are going to be, we're gonna have you know, full hospitals, like crowded hospitals with no capacity to respond. Same with ICU, but in ICU usage occupation, you have a, a greater, uh, a softer gradient. There's not a lot of, you know, clusters of high levels, low levels. It's more um, divided in evenly. Um, and um, th this is mortality uh, within regions. And you can see the variability, particularly when you look at the uh, rate per million. I mean, right now, everything is green here and there's a little bit of yellow. But they used the, there was a, a moment not not far along where it was red, yellow, red, orange, yellow, green, and white, all together at the same time, and some going up, some going down. Now this was generally low everywhere in the country, but it's it always very heterogeneous. And we try to do an analysis within regions, like let's say the Midwest or the West Coast or the East Coast, that as, as you would you would do in the U.S. We analyze it by regional part, uh, but parts of the country that are connected, usually by highways. So their connectivity and this people flow. Um, and this is the central coast all around Lima. Um, and most of the regions you can see are, have a very similar pattern, um, you know, except for Ica here that had a third wave, or you know, really clear third wave. Maybe Callao had a little bit of third wave in the middle, but most of the other regions basically have one major moment and then another one, two, two big, big waves. And we monitor all their numbers together to get a better idea of what's going on. And you know, if one indicator goes up, let's say positivity goes up first, then the number of cases should go up, then the hospitalization rates should go up, then the ICU occupation goes up and then that's increased. So you, you have observed in the past a sequence. So that's why we monitor all the indicators at the same time, looking for trends. And we make a weekly report of this. And, and this is another expression of the heterogeneity. Um, the Amazon basin was one of the first regions to be hit really badly, both in the first as well as in the second wave. And now it's white. They barely have any mortality. It's also low populated. And, and then the, the, the southern part of the country here, which was in the southern part as where the uh, infection rates were, they were still high, high until late. And you can see that this is the, the, the southern coast, the last region to, to, to be up and come down in the central and southern high, uh, the, sorry, the southern um, highlands and jungle is also somewhere around here as one of the last regions to come. But you can see in this course how heterogeneous a country is despite being teeny tiny country. And this, all this heterogeneity in the first wave particularly occurred despite a massive lockdown. So it's, it's a very complex phenomenon that you really have to get deep into understanding. And that's part of the simplicity of many of the analysis that have been made. So prevalence surveys have been very informative um, in, in, in telling us that we had incredibly high levels of infection early on, like in June, 
you can see 70% in the jungle and that's out of this world. This was the highest, the highest rate published uh, that early in the pandemic. And um, in, in September, November, and, and there've been some numbers later on that have not been publicly confirmed, have, have signaled 60, 70%, 60% in other parts of the country, saying that we were getting close to, um, to or closer to what we thought was um, a, a herd immunity rates until Delta came and with the higher transmissibility, it increased the level of um, herd immunity and that maybe now we're reaching with the help of immunization plus a really strong second wave. And Dr. Lescano, may I ask a question? Please, yes. So a question from the audience. So the US, in my opinion, initially struggled at coordinating viral sequencing and data collection to use variant data to help drive public health decision-making. How does Peru identify variants and respond? Was there or is there a national viral sequencing center or program as we're talking about Delta right now? That's, that's, that's a fantastic question. And um, can you imagine if a country with the resources of the US as a travel and under better leadership, um, how, you know, a teeny tiny country with minimal capacities in a time where molecular diagnostic resources were really limited. The struggle has been huge. And the struggle has been technical and political as well, because there are, there's one major center for diagnostics in the country and for laboratory. This is um, an institution that is, a, that represents a, what would be a fr the laboratory fraction of CDC that we call it National Institutes of Health, ENS. So the, this institution runs the labs of the country, of the, the public labs. But they started by requiring a very complex uh, certification program if somebody wanted to do diagnostics. So it made it really difficult for anybody to do COVID diagnostics officially. So they prevented private labs, universities, and many others from doing diagnosis to the point that the private labs used to send them their samples for testing. And they were backlogged months. And eventually, you know, they, they, they licensed more labs and their, the, the antigenic tests came in and were not backlogged. But that, that was a very major mistake in, uh, that affected later all the dynamics related to molecular diagnosis and later to sequencing because they're really territorial and, and vertical. And when sequencing started to be important and when, when variants in November started to show to be critical, some people were already doing sequencing, even when they were not licensed um, to provide official tests that we were doing sequencing at Cayetano University, for example. And the government was also doing sequencing and it was a battle for publications. It was not a battle for public health. It was a battle of who publishes first, what variants have been going on. And the Cayetano group said, hey, listen, you guys are missing it. We have a new local variant from the Andes. And it's, it's very similar to something that is happening in Chile. And um, it may be an Andean thing. It's similar to the, um, the, the, the variant from Brazil that originated in the region. And the people from the government were saying, no, no, we, we've been sequencing these mutations and these mutations are telling us that we have, um, a, a, I think it's alpha. And the people from Cayetano were like, no, no, you should not do those sequences, those, those mutations, because those mutations are common between this local strain, the local variant and the other variant. You need to sequence the whole virus. And no, 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 we have this standardized kit that we were sent from from abroad, we, we know it, we got it. So for the longest time, there was a discussion of, you know, about what the variant and eventually the, the, when the, the government did sequencing, we, they discovered that we had a new variant and they went and rushed and published, of course, not sharing their data with anybody. And uh, it, it's, it's still now their data is not uh, fully available on GSET. Um, so there's been an ongoing battle between the government institute and, and it's, a, it's just a small group of people in that institution 
who are, you know, who are getting a great opportunity to publish in a way that they never published before. And that's becoming ahead of um, the important public health decisions that we should have made. Now, I am a citizen, you know, I don't need to know whether there's Delta, Alpha, Beta or whatever circulating. I need to use my masks. I need to get vaccinated. I think there's a major confusion of what we need, what the public needs to know about variants because variant A or B doesn't matter. Take care of yourself, all of all the mandates of, of government. So I think in a way, the information about variants has been very good for journals and very good for uh, newspapers. The common citizen really should act in the same way until everybody's vaccinated. And I, I think that's, that's a mistake. That's been, we, we got confused along the way and we did think that we, we should pay attention to things that we should have not. Because uh, at least here, nothing needed to change. And, you know, a booster dose or, you know, third dose, and I call it booster, Third dose for people older than 65 and, and, and physicians, yes, on due time, let's vaccinate the others first because we gain more benefit from vaccinating everybody in a country that doesn't have full access to vaccines. But there's been a lot of attention and misdirection because of variants and because of the information. So I think we need to really balance what, what we need to do to confront variants and what we need to do to confront the pandemic overall. Um, so, um, sorry for the very long explanation, but no, all thank of you. these are, are, are so, <laughs> they have so many layers. Um, and the other thing is the disparities that, that this data show, like the lowest socioeconomic uh, levels had four times as much prevalence as the, the, the higher socioeconomic levels. So, my children and me, you know, we, we do okay in life and we are at high risk because we never got infected. We managed to survive the pandemic while lower SES, so many people have gotten infected. They probably are partially living in herd immunity. Um, and uh, we are a problem. We, the higher economic levels, as a socioeconomic level people, we are a problem. Our, our children in their schools are a problem we are probably gonna be the ones who are going to generate the third wave because we have been less exposed, even with vaccines until, moment, until this moment, our children are going to be the problem because vaccines are not yet there yet. They're still, we're still vaccinating adults. So uh, these disparities are still killing us. And this all happens in a really challenging times of uh, political environment. Uh, two presidents, three presidents basically in one week, on two weeks, um, and with two citizens' deaths, death in the process and the, the protests, the, you know, the shortest duration of ministers in history in, 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 um, just after 2016 with ministers of health, uh, one of the shortest uh, duration of tenure, uh, people are fired. Um, all the noise from all the media and everybody in Facebook and Twitter and posting with very limited knowledge, you know, uh, instantaneous experts on different areas that misunderstand our data because they never worked with it. And, and, you know, this has just created a lot of noise. And then on top of it, and, and I didn't cover this in the previous, uh, previous talk and uh, I'm really mad at myself for it, the vacuum, the vacuna gate, the Sinopharm trial in which extra doses were brought in officially, approved by the, all the regulatory entities and the university to immunize the research team and related personnel in a definition way too broad. That it was a major mistake that nobody noticed, or if they noticed, they didn't want to say anything. That this was a a, a a potential problem, a major problem, and many people got vaccinated as part of the trial, and I was one of them. And uh, I'm still in a process of investigation. And our, our vice rector of research, Carlos Cáceres, just published an article two days ago, describing and for the first time in with a lot of perspective, but it's still not necessarily pleasing anybody. 
but with a lot of perspective describing the, event, the events as part of an article about the 60 years of Cayetano, the university, saying how complex this is and how many facets this trial, you know, this, this component of the trial had. And th this has been the cause of a lot of pain and suffering for the university and, and investigators and the country itself. And luckily we got over it the um, initial negative reactions towards the vaccine and towards vaccines and science. And now people are getting really heavily vaccinated. So we have learned so much from all of this. Um, sorry, the, the question. Yeah, just wanted to check in, Dr. Lescano. We have about 10 minutes left before the end. Uh, if you want to wrap up in the next five minutes, maybe then we could have sort of an open discussion. Will that work? Uh, yes, absolutely. OK, absolutely. thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean, epidemiologically, we learn how complex this, this, this is, how heterogeneous. But definitely, Peru has been hit hard, but I don't think there's any difference between Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, or any other country. We've all hit hard, but we have much better data, and we've been very transparent about it. Um, the social connectivity uh, of, of, this, of society these days and the disparities have made Mass major drivers of the level of mortality we've seen, and it, it just show how frail uh, health systems are. So um, we've learned also many things not from outside epidemiology. We we learn how valuable is uh, patience and respect for the opinions of others, even when they are um, loud, wrong, and. <laughs> in just creating damage, but we really need to learn to disagree with everybody, with, with others and, and survive. And, you know, uh, taking media training are definitely must for us in uh, the sciences world to be able to communicate across areas and important to build bridges. I've been, um, having been isolated because of my participation in vaccine trials, the bridges I built over 30 years of work have been very helpful to remain very active in science and in epidemiology and public health. And this is just a sign, uh, you know, a first event of many that are gonna continue coming. So prepare for the next one, learn from this one as much as we can and let's not repeat our mistakes. And that's all for the talk and uh, delighted to be able to talk to you, uh, listen to your thoughts and opinions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Lescano. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. And um, I'd like to open up to everyone for any questions. Um, I'll give it a minute. I also have some prepared if you need a moment to gather your thoughts. But yeah, first, just to say a really big thank you uh, for sharing, sharing your experience and your expertise with us. My pleasure, as always. All right, while we're, while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I had a question with respect to, you know, you yourself have worn a lot of different hats. You have a lot of different expertise. Um, how do you sort of meld those different systems of knowledge and perspectives um, in facing, you know, a public health crisis like this pandemic? Uh, that's that's something very interesting. Um, it's it's been. I lived uh, all my professional life jumping from field to field, so it's probably something that I gotten used to. I'm an engineer by training. I'm an IT person. That's my background. I that's what I went to college, and that's how I started. So soon I had to learn to deal with physicians and learn from them epidemiology and physiopathology and epidemiology and many other ologies that I was not trained on. So that maybe helped me to talk to people who are not from my field and to mingle and learn from other fields. Maybe that's something that has helped me. And I was a weird bird for the longest time because I was the one IT person in the middle of physicians. And they still look at me like that here. 
but that has been maybe why I, uh, I've been able to move from research and immunology and molecular biology and my, some of my research to epidemiology behavior. Uh, I have a master's in health policy that because of my interest on, you know, going into that field. So I, it, I, I try to have all the skills over time also to build them. But that's that's maybe why that I'm 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 used to I was since nineteen early nineteen nineties I was used to have to talk to different languages and learn different things I don't know and now now that is a mainstream no that's the norm that you have to be able to cross bridges. Thank you for that. We have a question. Hi, Dr. Lascano. It's Kate Doval. Good to see you. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, just following up on Bronwyn's question, um, I think a lot of students here are interested in also being involved in policy and research and wondering if you have any advice on as they're kind of preparing to move into a similar career as you, any advice on um, things they should really consider or skills they should build um, moving into these roles? Well, the um, I I'm 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 familiar with that um, with that interest since the day there was no funding for it, and when people wanted to do global health, they would write to my mentor, you know, a three-page email saying I want to go to Peru and you know work on tuberculosis and do this study and do that and this that and I, I want to do this, and three weeks later my mentor would write a one-liner just come and we'll see. And if you had the guts and you come to Peru on the word of this old man, there is one liner, that was half of the work. That was half of the job, you know, you, you got it. Because that showed that you were willing to take big challenges. Uh, it's very different now. There are so much resources that, you know, you apply to five fellowships for the summer, for your first year between first and second year. And then you pick which one you wanna go to. When I go to Kenya, when I go to Thailand, or when I come to Peru, and it, it's very different, and it's it's become in a way a numbers game. Like how many boxes do I check to make it to an MPH and to make it to a global health program and to get this this fellowship or this program? It's not about that. It's about what happens down south. It's about what happens in settings like deep down in these communities that have been hit by the pandemic. So I think it's a lot about commitment. It's a lot about, you know, devoting yourself for long periods of time to something and finding that something that uh, as something that really motivates you that you want to devote the rest of your life. Um, and you guys are really extremely well selected where you are, you know, medical school, you know, you have to be top of your class already. So you, 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 you all have all the basic ingredients. You, I think it's a lot of committing to something and following up for the next 10 to 20 years. But don't, don't fall in the numbers game. Don't fall into ticking boxes. It's not about that. It's, a, it's about the long-term relationships. Awesome, thank you. Completely agree. Oh, thank you, thank you. The, with the decolonizing of global health movement, uh, some of these thoughts have appeared to be more common, but it's been going on for a long time. All right, thank you. I think we may have time for one more question, if anyone has one. I know many people have class. So we can also finish a few minutes early. So you have time. Dr. Lescano, just a huge thank you. Mil gracias for being here and speaking to us. Um, it's a pleasure. And I'm sure if anyone needs to follow up, we can go through the channels to get in touch with Dr. Lescano. So again, a big thank you. Big round of applause over Zoom. Um, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, you, you guys, uh, and appreciate it. I hope that I can visit you again at some point and have a longer conversation about uh, all of these channel uh, challenges. Have a good one. Bye -bye. We would love that. Thank you, Ellie. Take care. Bye. Bye.